Well, hey, everybody, thanks so much for joining us for this special series that uh, I've got a couple of working titles for. The one I like today is, so I got to my new church and then so did a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking to people who are in their brand new setting and in their first year or two or maybe three uh, on comes 2020 and I you know I don't know about you if you're a pastor but I went to seminary at Princeton and they didn't have a class on pandemics like it just <laughs> I got a lot of Greek I got some Hebrew but I didn't get any pandemic so uh, we're all learning as we go unless you happen to be 102 years old which some Presbyterian ministers are and uh, then, then you're old enough to say, I was there when, but, but if you're not, then we're all figuring it out. And today, I'm so glad I've got my friend Ricky Jenkins on. Uh, Ricky is at Southwest Church, and I, I know a lot of people know you, Ricky, but I'd love it if you just tell a little of your story of, of where you've been and how you ended up where you are. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for having me, man. It's just a blessing to, to be here and share. So yeah, some of my story is uh, born and raised in in Jackson, Mississippi, and it's kind of pastored uh, all over. Jackson, then Oakland, California for several years, kind of an inner city setting. Memphis, Tennessee, was with Brian Loritz there for several years, then started a PhD up at Trinity Seminary, helped out some churches in Chicago, back to Memphis where we thought we'd be forever. And then all of a sudden this church in the middle of the desert, uh, Coachella Valley Southwest Church calls on me and my wife, April, uh, to come and serve. And it's just been such uh, an imperfect fit that it fits. And it has been a blessing. We've been serving now almost three years with our three children. And uh, you, you said it best, man, none of my seminary classes, even when we talked about church history, they didn't deal with the church history when they went through pandemics. So I am on the ground. The plane has taken off and we're trying to build wings in the middle of the world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, years ago, we were doing a, a strat op session with our lead team and you know, the guy running the thing said, tell me how things work around here. And I said, well, I've often said on our lead team, we're really good at jumping out of planes and then building the parachute on the way down, which is kind of <laughs> what everybody's doing right now, right? That's what it feels uh, like. And then <laughs> my dear friend, Holly Tate, who's been on our lead team for a long, 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 as long as it's been around, uh, yeah. the, the, the consultant said, actually, I think we're just good at jumping out of planes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, tell me what that's like. You get there. I mean, you you kind of walked into a, a bumpy situation. We managed the, the yep. search and helped the committee yep. and you all find each other. And I, yep. I know every church has its own challenges, but you you walked into a, a, a unique setting, right? Sure. sure, we did. We did. So kind of a series, uh, William, of what I would call as three unfortunate endings to the three previous pastorates uh, that were kind of community shaking. And so, um, you know, not going to go into the, the trauma of that story, but I did become a part of a congregation that had experienced pretty significant trauma with previous, uh, you know, epics of leadership. And so the staff was wounded and a lot of the people were wounded that we had a certain kind of, you know, reputation in the community and came into all that. Uh, the guy that handed it off to me, Ray Johnson, was amazing and brought them to a measure of healing. And then I got to come and kind of, he pitched a softball and the church has been flying. And um, lots of, I mean, I think two, 2,500 people have come to Christ in the last three years at wow. this ministry. Uh, we had just started to kick off before the pandemic started a $7 million campaign to start building and start doing some compassion initiatives. Uh, our launch pledge night was scheduled for March 17th. And then oh you there's a virus coming from a place called Wuhan and oh the world my. changes, right? So we went from this kind of terrible, traumatic history to like, oh gosh, I think we're experiencing revival in our times and pandemic. <laughs> That's kind of the setting right now. How did when so when it first hit, like, I mean, you're in California, in Southern California. This is a pretty politically charged place but right. how long did it take to settle in and how quickly did you realize this is going to be different and and just to follow on that like did you have any idea it last as long as it would well you know i'll be i'll be honest with you i'm kind of looking at wuhan right december and january and i'm talking to doctors and nurses who are saying yeah this happens every seven eight years and it, ne it never is a big deal but I would tell them, but it's a global economy and people in China fly over here every day. 
So what does that mean? And so I was one of the weirdos in January in February who was thinking, this thing's coming to us. We don't get to not, we don't get to be free from anything because we're global now mm -hmm. in our world. And so I was one of the ones who sounded like a conspiracist in February. I'm telling my exec team, this is, this is, this is, this is happening. I remember when all the churches in the country, late February, early March, were saying things like, hey, we're going to start washing our hands no more hug time. I remember telling that to our church thinking, we're not gonna be here next weekend. We are not gonna be here next weekend. Sure enough, lockdown and there we are. And so I was one of the few who just call it being a worry wart, but I was thinking, yeah, this, is, this, this won't be a two month thing. This will be a real thing. And I have friends now who tell us, we thought you were nuts back in February and March and saying, prepare for a year of weirdness. So I will say in God's grace, he did give our church a sense of, if you will, wisdom and clarity to come into it preparing for what, whatever we thought would be a long haul, which I said, hey, Easter 2021, I think is kind of going to be the other side of the new normal. Uh, so that was something we had going for us, William, looking like complete idiots in uh, the sky is falling all through the well, You know what? We, <laughs> it, it, we've got a lot in common because there are a lot of people think I look like an idiot too. So, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, it's all good. No, we, I, you're more optimistic than I am. I'm, I'm thinking back to school 21 mm -hmm. by then. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping mm -hmm. we'll have our normal sort of back to school deal and we might have a great Easter and we might, who knows, we might have something sooner than that. But uh, uh, yep. we did the same thing. We battened down. I, I made the mistake of reading an article uh, by Andy Crouch and another fellow okay. uh, called oh, Leaning yeah. Beyond that. the Blizzard. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the great article. Don't read it right before bed. It's not a bedtime story. No. Uh, but, but basically back in late February, early March, they pegged it as 12 to 18 months of a mess. Yes. And uh, that's where yeah. it's been. And, and you guys, Southern California, it's been a little bit more of a mess. I mean, you guys... You, you got a governor that's made some headlines and uh, we had an election this year. I don't know if you realize that, but. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Where tell, was me how, tell me how all that played in. Cause I mean, you're in a pretty unique setting. You really, you really are in the middle of the desert. Yes. Yes, we, we are. We are. And, you know, kind of Coachella Valley is somewhat of a conservative bastion uh, politically. And then Governor Newsom, which I would say is largely on the opposite side of how most folks operate here politically. So you got the, the awkwardness of a pandemic, quarantining, locking down. I'm in a retirement community, right? Where most of our folks are like, hey, this affects older people. And this town is mostly older folks, coupled with now our governor, I guess, seeing numbers that he's got doing his thing to keep us safe, but in a place that really feels like it's, ugh, that's a bit, that's a bit borderline religious freedom. That's a bit borderline, hey, why do they get to be open and we not be open? And so, man, you name it. And then uh, obviously the racial strife that has kind of onset yeah. in our culture in this moment. So I would say a perfect storm. So there have been days where I wish I was pastoring in Iowa. Let me just say it that way. Not today. Midwest is not where to be not right today. now while we're filming. But not today. This, uh, so during this perfect storm, I'd love to. I, hey, I didn't talk about this ahead of time, so I'm hitting you blind. But sure. like, all right, you're black. I'm black. Last time I Your checked. Your church is not. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like when this racial tension hit, how did that uniquely hit you? Yeah. And your family, because you, you're kind of in a, a different setting than most people would find themselves. Absolutely. Well, we, we, we've aspired to be a multi-ethnic church since I got here three years ago, William, but we still do not know exactly what that means. I feel like it's going to take us a generation to really unpack that biblically and create that in our culture. But yeah, brother, if I can be vulnerable um, with you, um, the George Floyd, the Ahmaud Arbery, the Breonna Taylor uh, flashpoints, when those things happen, because of my significant experiences, those things break my heart. Those things stir up fear in me. Those things help make me extra careful for the care of my children. And mm -hmm. I'm in a place where largely there's not many who have similar experiences that can understand that. And so I it was really not just battling the weight of the pandemic and the political stuff. I was balancing the weight of, can I be here long-term with so many wow. people that don't understand how I look at the world versus how they look at the world. Um, is this a safe place for me? And all the other lies that, that I kind of had to wrestle with, but through prayer and reflection, 
you know, God in his own way kind of said, you know what, I'm not surprised by what's happening and I sent you here anyways. And so I knew what I was doing, trust in that. And I have found our people to be very, very eager to learn my side of the story, my side Mm -hmm. of the perspective. It's hard, it is not easy. A lot of us have Rachel Maddow and Tucker Carlson preaching to us instead of scripture, and you've had to navigate the thickness of that. But I'm seeing, I'm seeing light at the end of the tunnel. I'm having conversations with guys who don't look like me or don't mm-hmm. think like me, um, talk about our common faith that we have in Christ. And we're inch by inch, we're gaining a little understanding. So just George Floyd pops off. I'm supposed to be preaching about Joseph. There's no way that I can handle that well with what's going on in my heart and in my soul. And I just preach the theology on racism and what God has to say uh, about reconciliation. It was one of the hardest messages I've ever preached in my life to largely a congregation that ha- has never had to contend with those things. But the encouragement, the embrace, um, the receptance that came in that moment for our little old church has been huge for me. Conversations now with my elder board about race and What do we want to be celebrating in 20 years racially? What do we want wins for our kids to be as we navigate these moments? How do we equip our people? It's been hard. And to be quite honest, this summer, I was probably a depressed pastor. But getting on the other side of that, having real meaningful conversation is literally why I moved to this place in the first place. So God brings fruit, man, out of wilderness each and every time. Yeah, springs in the desert. That's right. That's right. I was Isaiah 43. Anyways, wherever it is, it's in the Bible. It, it seems like that, you know, COVID is the great accelerator, uh, whether it's churches going online or whatever, but, but the, the racial tension thing, the, the heat came faster and, yep. and I'm hoping the healing will come faster. But I, what I'm hearing, uh, you know, we've launched a diversity practice and we've, sure. we've been at this a long time, sure. um, but I'm just hearing folks say we're taking a few more inches than we usually would. Mm. Not like we're going to solve it. You know, I'm That's task oriented. I want to find the three steps to fix it and then move on. Well but uh, I'm, I'm well hearing said. those incremental steps are going a little faster than normal. Let me That's ask right. you something, Ricky. You said sure. you thought you were a depressed pastor. I, I was talking to a friend of mine recently, and uh, he pastors a really large church. Mm-hmm. And um, he was saying some nice things to me about the work we did. And I said, well, thanks, man. And he said, well, my prayer is that you steward the next 24 months well. I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. He said, no, you're about to have your busiest 24 months ever. Wow. I'm like, well, now you're just being nice. He said, no, you know me. I don't say nice things. I say truth. And huh. here's what I know, William. Eight out of 10 pastors I talk to are about ready to quit. And you're, there's going to be more churn in the kingdom than ever before. Mm-hmm. And you guys need to be ready for that. So I, I, I've dropped back now. Okay, maybe there'll be churn. Maybe we'll be busy. But mm-hmm. like just to think. Mm-hmm. That this pastor, who's very wise and very in touch with thousands and thousands, eight out of ten pastors depressed. You just mentioned, you know, a couple months ago, you were at that depressed spot. I'm guessing there are people watching or listening right now who are on that border of depression. Mm-hmm. I mean, I see people putting out their holiday lights in October, and I'm like, okay, somebody <laughs> needs some joy. <laughs> you know, uh, what what got you through? What are some tangible steps that got you through those moments of depression that that you might be able to share with listeners right now. I will, I will. And, and William, to be honest, it's the stuff we all know as pastors, but 2020 is the year where you're forced to practice what you say you believe. Oh, wow. One of the things we say we believe is that I'm supposed to work hard, then rest well. Work hard and then rest well. And I found myself, just like you, I bet, pandemic starts, I'm working more than I ever have before in my life. I'm working six days a week, seven nights a week, and that's literal. That's not hyperbole. Mm. And I had a mile marker conversation with the chair of our elder board. His name is Scott Walker. Scott's a great friend and a wise man. And I put my vacation off. I usually take July off because in July, the desert's temperature goes to hell plus. Usually, (laughs) Usually it's just hell. July goes to hell plus and we get away. And I said, you know what? No, not this year. People are struggling. We've got a food ministry where there's a few hundred cars out there. The, our folks are suffering. I'm going to stay and suffer. And I work all the way through July, which is usually when my mind and heart is saying, hey, we're tired. Get us away with the family. And I ignore that voice. 
And I have a conversation with Scott Walker who sits me down and basically says, Ricky, the pandemic will be here when you get back. Mm. So you may as well do what you need to do for you so you can be strong for others. And you know, the thing we all preach to ourselves, to our people, when we tell them the rest, when you get on a flight, the flight attendant says, hey, if, the, <laughs> if it happens and the mask drops, don't put it on the kid first, put it on you so you can get what you need to put that mask on that's someone good. else. And that's what I would say to my fellow pastors out there. Don't ignore rest. Don't ignore time with the family. Don't ignore your own devotional life because you can't help anyone in crisis if you aren't being helped yourself. So the, so uh, the, tur the turning for me was getting away in the month of August and getting pastored and getting loved on and hearing from God afresh fishing. One day I caught eight bass. I just think your audience needs to know that, by the way. Uh, but it was through those those retreats, right, where I was restored and able to kind of come back to what God had called us to. And I have more joy, more peace now in the midst of a crisis. We're still in this thing. And so That's just good. practice what you preach. Yeah. I, I was on a flight before all this mess. Uh -huh. Southwest, you know, and they, they're, not, they're not known for being too serious. Sure. And uh, I said... Uh, you know, if you're, if you're traveling with children, if the masks drop, yep. put your mask on your own face first, That's right. then pick your favorite child and put the mask on. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Well, William, I've got, I've got three kids. I've got two boys and my baby is a girl. And I always tell my church, I love my children equally. They're of equal importance in my heart. But if the house catches on fire, I'm getting that girl out first. <laughs> <laughs> she gets the mask first. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that, I'll tell you, though, that rest yourself and self-care is uh, something that we say forever. I, I remember the first year I was senior pastor of a fairly large church. And gosh, they told me to take a month off. And I'd never I'd been in smaller churches where you can't do that because somebody always dies. You got to go back. I mean, yes. there's nobody else to go to the funeral, right? You, you got to do the. I took that first month off and I, uh, so I went away for this month and I thought, you know, the world's going to catch on fire. I remember driving back into town, uh, after being gone a month. And as I rounded the turn on the freeway, the church sits not too far from the freeway, there was the steeple. And I thought that's right where I left it. Didn't go that's anywhere. Right. <laughs> right. The church that's didn't right. fall apart. And I think, you know, we can laugh about it. Uh, and we can say, you know, the pandemic will still be here. The steeple will still yeah. be there. But yeah. but I think that particularly for places that have had to lock down, the boundary between work and rest is blurrier than any other That's year right. in history. That's I, right. I, I was talking to Rich Belotus up in yeah. New York not sure. too long sure. ago. Love He's him. in an 800 square foot apartment. And I said, what mm -hmm. room are you in? He said, well, Right now, it's the podcast room for the pastor. It'll be the headmaster's office in a minute, and then it'll be our bedroom later tonight. So, you know, like, <laughs> it, it, Hear that. never before have we lost our sacred spaces like this. And, yes. I, and, and I just want to reiterate what Ricky's telling anybody that's listening out there. You need to find sequestered spaces, even if it's just, I have a chair in our house that I wouldn't do anything but my spiritual discipline in during that pandemic time. It, mm -hmm. uh, somebody else might have sat there and done something, but I wasn't sitting there unless I was doing that. And if I was do, yep. wanting to sit there and do something else, I wouldn't do it. Right, so yes. find ways to keep those boundaries. So so rest and self-care, mm -hmm. that's one thing that got you through the depression. What, what would Absolutely. be another example of something that pulled you through this far? Yeah, and I appreciate you asking. I think, I think the other side of it was, so I've, I've been trying to lead my people through what I call the three C's. This is just in Ricky's mind. It's not anything I share with them, even though they may listen to this and be like, oh, okay, now I see what he was doing. But it's context, comfort, and clarity. Context, comfort, and clarity. Um, context, William, you know, when the pandemic started, I read voraciously everything I could on pandemics. Mm. And what did the church do in pandemics? And brother, I was shocked to see a hundred years ago, um, by the way, which is when they wrote the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full in His Wonderful Face. That was written during the Spanish flu. 
And I look and I'm reading newspaper clippings where Americans are fighting about whether to wear a mask or whether not to wear a mask. There are conspiracy theories about what the government was up to. And everything, almost everything to the T that we're experiencing right now, we're going through 100 years ago. Then I looked up the Black Plague. Then I looked up at what Martin Luther did, had to deal with, Augustine, and found out, oh, pandemics are part of a fallen, broken world that happened every 10 to 15 years somewhere in the country. This one's a global, so that's weird. But I reminded myself that God's been here before, even though I haven't. That's and right. I just started to rehearse to our leadership team, this isn't the first pandemic. If he tarries, this won't be the last. And brother, it gave me some sense of wherewithal yes. in a place that in a moment so precarious and seems where the foundations is crumbling, I was reminded the church has been here before. The church's doors have been closed before for pandemics. And sometimes you got to tell yourself that this isn't unique to you. It's yeah. not unique to God. It's unique to you, but it's not unique to God. It's not unique to his church. And so just the weight of history, rehearsing that, That's learning right. that gave me a little bit of relief in my soul. The comfort, so was, the comfort was just, hey, give us this day our daily bread. We are blessed beyond measure. We're so privileged, praise God, for being in America. Hallelujah to the lamb. Mm. But because of that, man, we are you know, let's call it, there's some people out there who have lost their jobs who are truly suffering, but most of us are suffering from the thought of suffering. That's right. <laughs> you know, I ate today and, and I got the poundage to prove it. And, <laughs> and so because of that, we are, you know, just you know, what does the Holy Spirit's John 16, John 17 comfort have to say in this moment? And I think one of it is you had this luxury to plan your vacation in Mexico next year. You had this luxury to pick which NFL game or concert you're going to. That's gone to now the fruit of one day at a time, this day our daily bread means something in 2020 That's that it so couldn't good. mean in 2019. And then clarity. Clarity is if the doors of this church are closed, if the pandemic gets worse, Matthew 16, I think it's Matthew 16, I will build my church. There's one thing I knew that would survive this moment. It's the church. And I just decided I'm going to tell myself that every day. Now, April and May, I was pretty scared and depressed. But once June hit, <laughs> I started telling myself that every day. And so far, so good, man. And I think it's okay for surviving to be the new thriving in a crisis. And yeah. so I've kind of weaned myself off of the idols of everybody has to like me and everybody has to like my decisions. I am cured of those idols. Surviving is thriving. I still got a job. I'm still preaching the gospel. My wife still loves me. That's a win. <laughs> That's good. That's so good. I, I think, uh, you know, I was talking to Pastor Chris Hodges not too long yeah. ago and we were talking about, I told him I'm so tired of the word pivot. I go the rest of my, I had a guy tell me, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to title it Pivot. What do you think? And I was like, man, you don't want to know what I think because that's the dumbest idea I've heard. Line. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he said, well, here's the word I'm tired of. Unprecedented. This is not unprecedented. Not. This has happened before and a lot worse. And last I checked, Christians are not getting sawed in half in the United States right now. Like Last I checked. This is not, and, and I just had to think, and I thought, you know, Ricky, I've gotten punch drunk on church growth. Uh -huh, like, oh, uh -huh. how many are we running today? You know, like, that's uh -huh. the thing you say at a conference. Uh -huh. How many are you running? Uh -huh. Well, it, it, you know, I, I'll tell you a verse that's just haunted me mm -hmm. since we've started to reopen, and you've seen these levels come back of 20% over this time last year, 40% sure. is sure. a good number right now. And sure. guys are depressed, and I'm, and I'm taken back to... Uh, it's in Esther, and it's where the second wave of exiles is coming home from Babylon. Uh -huh. And they see the temple that's been built, and it's smaller than the temple was before. It wept. And there's this uh, amazing verse in the third chapter mm -hmm. where it says that the, peop the older folks who came back and saw the smaller temple started weeping so loudly, but the new people were so excited to have the temple, and they were praising so loudly. And the mixture of those two sounds could be heard all throughout mm -hmm. the land. And I thought, Rich. that is wow. where we're living right now. Wow. Wow. Isn't, that's such isn't a that it? Metaphor. That's it. That's it. And my dad said, when my dad's a pastor, I'm a fourth generation pastor. My dad said when this started, and my kids are six, four, and two, dad said, this will be the best year of your kids' lives. Yeah, it'll mark them. Because all they're going to have is daddy and mama. And I've right. gone through the worst year yeah, while they're the going only, through their best. The only uh, casualty in this will be their grandchildren 
who for every family dinner for the rest of their life going to have to well back when i was in high school and we were in 2020 <laughs> right. and 2020. Exactly right. yeah hey they will know our kids in 20 years as the pandemics <laughs> yeah, that's right that's right that's exactly right. hey so i want to touch on one other thing just because I'm, I'm privy to a little bit of what's going on at southwest because you guys sure. have hired us to do a couple searches here and there even in the sure. middle of this and sure. like not just oh my gosh our worship pastor left and we need a worship pastor but like I didn't manage to search, but I was like, so I saw we did like a, a Spanish speaking search and it was like, yeah, basically they wanted this, 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 and this, and this tiny little pigeonhole, like preferably bilingual, preferably one of them Spanish mainly and one of them English mainly and preferably and preferably. And I said, what'd you tell me? He said, oh, we got it. We'll do it. So, and apparently they did. So that's cool. But they did. <laughs> but, they did. but aside from that, I just thought, how cool is it? Ricky must have his church marching forward on mission, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. in a state where it's locked down. Is that, am I close to right on that? And if so, how in the world did you do that? Well, I'll, I'll say this much, that is our North Star. And so one of the things we were compelled to do when all this started was to reaffirm how our mission is not pandemic dependent, like, or is not peace, uh, peace dependent, that is mm. pandemic proof. And wow. so gospel singing, multi-ethnic, intergenerational, we love discipleship, that is our mission, works with a closed building, it works with an open building, it works in wartime, it works in peacetime, because that is the heart of the gospel. And so we retaught our mission for months and how mm. to get our mission done when the church is closed. And I feel like those for whom are truly in love with Christ and with that mission, they're on fire right now. They're moving forward. And I think the church responded to that in the way of faithfulness and generosity, faithfulness and their prayerful support. And honestly, as we asked you guys, Brian Jensen, I literally said, yeah, so Brian, your job is to go find the Messiah. So that's, that's, we need the Messiah, go find that guy. But it's amazing. I think the people that we've been hiring and that we've been talking to are seeing that commitment in the midst of this mm. brokenness. We refuse to wait till the vaccine's here. And the pandemic is gone to propound our mission. And honestly, we got three new pastors that are moving here in a few weeks. I think that won their hearts over that we weren't wow. waiting till the pandemic is done to be this gospel centered, mission focused church that God's called us to be. I'm not saying we're doing a lot of things well. The mission, I believe that we are doing well. And it's why I it's why I love this place. It's why I love what's going on now. You guys have been a part of that, man. Well, I, I love that you're staying on that North Star. And I'll tell you, if you're listening today and you're wondering how in the world am I going to convince somebody to move during a pandemic? I mean, who wants to add extra uncertainty to their life in 2020? <laughs> well, people that see a mission, uh, people that right. see something like what Pastor Ricky's doing at Southwest Church. And I just encourage you up the talk about vision, mm -hmm. up it. the talk about mission. It, it will... Uh, Jesus said, you lift me up, I will draw people to myself, you know, and that, yeah. that's true for staffing too. You lift mm -hmm. him up and the mission he's given and people will come to you. It's even, mm -hmm. I don't, you said, go find Messiah. I wondered why I approved a plane ticket to Nazareth. I don't know what he went down there for, but. <laughs> it worked out. He even brought us some water from the river Jordan. <laughs> Oh, Ricky, you're such a blessing, man. I, I know you're busy and, and I know you're getting rest, but I know you're still busy and, and people don't know you did this on the fly. I text you and within 24 hours, here we are on a, on a Zoom call. Thank you so much for making time for us. Yeah, well, we love you guys. It's an honor to come on and encourage this audience. Pastors, I love you. I'm praying for you every day. I pray for pastors every day of my life. This mm -hmm. is our moment. I'm praying for you. You got a cheerleader over here in the Coachella Valley rooting for all you guys. That's awesome. Blessings to you, Ricky, and Southwest Church. We love you, and we're here for you. Blessings, my brother. Thanks, man. And thank you all for listening. Be sure and check out the rest of this series where we're talking to people who got to a new church, and the pandemic came right afterward. And I, I think you'll find some encouragement and some tactical steps in listening to how God's guide some of these pastors. So tune in again next time. And uh, if you need show notes, if you want to see links to Ricky and the church and all those things, just go to vandercast.com. You can find everything you need there. God bless you. Hang in there. And we will see the other side of this. The one thing every pandemic has in common, they all end. Every That's one it. of them. So Good news. bless you.